welcome to the Help My Wealth podcast, Money Rules or Money Rules. Here at Help My Wealth, we are all about empowering financial success in our community of listeners. We hope you find today's topic both informative and helpful. Hi, welcome back to the Help My Wealth podcast, Money Rules, Money Rules. I'm your host, Stephen Logan, and with me today, as always, is Hamish Ferguson. Hamish, thank you for coming. No problems at all. And today, our special guest is Dr. Marty Chi. Ciao. How are you? Yep, I'm good. Thanks for having me here. No, no problems at all. Dr. Marty Chia is the Associate Professor of Finance at the University of Newcastle and is currently the Academic Director of the Tax Clinic for the University of Newcastle. The Tax Clinic provides pro bono tax advice and services for the underrepresented and disadvantaged individuals and small business taxpayers in the Hunter region. Marty has authored over 20 articles in research uh, in the area of finances and related subjects. So, Matthew, thank you. Uh, Marty, thank you so much for coming today. Yep. So today we want to talk about some of the um, researches that you've done, particularly in, in regards to you know, trading, uh, thin fluences and the propensity of gambling in Australia. That's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> but it's, it sounds like it's a bit of a, a passion for you. You've um, done quite a lot of research in regards to those sort of areas. Yes, so it's, uh, I guess my passion in finance um, begins ever since I was doing a Bachelor of Commerce mm-hmm. back at Monash in Melbourne. Mm-hmm. So I was always interested in, I guess, the financial markets and especially investment in the stock market. Mm-hmm. So which is why I proceeded proceeded to do honours and PhD in finance. So my PhD topic is about stock market in investment. Uh, so whereby I actually look at why some stocks tend to generate high returns and why some tend to generate a low return. So is there, a, I guess, a rational or a risk-based reason on why that is the case because in finance we always tell I guess our students that there's a high risk high return relationship but we know that in practice that is not always the case whereby people are not always rational Mm. right so this is why instead of having a rational based reason that causes this cross-sectional difference in stock returns there might be a behavioral reason behind people's Mm. I guess um people's uh, action Right, so this also motivated why I actually look at um trading behavior of investors. So why mo- so what motivated investors to trade? Right, so is it because um of influence from other people, or is it because they're actually using it as a substitute for something else? Right, so that's so I guess um the examination of those pattern in stock returns and the mechanism behind it is what always interested me. Mm. And so did uh, so obviously it sounded like your interest started with um, stocks and, and stock returns and, and the stock market and then um, you know it, it moved into the areas of gambling and 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 you know the propensity of gambling in Australia and in other places do you find there's a, a, a correlation between the two that uh, you know people some people who use the stock market um, and some people who do gambling have a similar sort of view and, and outlook Yes, yes. So, so I guess um, in terms of academic research, so there's always this, um, I guess, um, common understanding that we have some, of course, all investors are different, right? Mm-hmm. So there'll be some, there'll be more professional and more rational, and there'll be some section that we call um, gambler investor yes. that actually use stock market, as, I guess, as a way to, in a way, take a punt. Yes. Right. So, so of course, right. So there's uh, this correlation between those subgroup of investors Right, so between their gambling propensity and how often they trade in the share market. Yes. And there are some stocks that tend to attract the attention of those um, gambling investors more. Yep. Right? And those stocks tend to have, I guess, greater volatility and uh, they have like, a greater chance of having a big one day positive or negative return yep. because that seems to be close to gambling behaviors. Yeah. So look, I wanted to start by, um, you know, starting with the gambling and, and, and talking about that. I mean, I, I was uh, always assumed that Australia had um, a large gambling, um, you know, habit or, or culture, uh, but I was quite surprised to find that we're, compared to the rest of the world, we're actually quite high up there, you know. Where, where mm-hmm. does Australia sort of sit in regards to gambling and, and gambling habits like per population? Yeah, so that's that's a really good question because well, I guess we, if we think about the Australian population, right, so it's quite small relative yeah. to like I guess other big countries like the United States or China, but on a per person or a per capita basis, we are actually the nation with the greatest gambling behavior. Right, yeah. so uh, a statistics uh, from the Queensland Statistician Office actually shows that uh, on a yearly basis, Australian gambled over two hundred million dollars on various gambling-related activities. 
like casinos, gaming, and online platforms, and we actually lost over twenty billion dollars. Right, so if we actually translate that onto into a purpose and basis, it means that on average, Australia lost over thirteen hundred dollars per person. Per person. Yeah, per person on yeah. average. Right, so this is actually rank the first among all the nations. So if we look at some comparative statistics from other countries, they would not. Right? So they actually, they actually did not lose lose that much on a per capita basis, even though the aggregate level is higher because they are a much greater or bigger nation. Yeah, I mean, I think when I was reading your research, is um, you know, two statistics that stood out to me more than anything else, which um, sort of blew me away a little bit, is that we currently have 20% of the world's poker machines. That's that's a huge percentage, particularly when you realise that Australian population is only 0.33% of the world's population. That's a big difference, isn't it? Yes, exactly. So this shows, <laughs> I guess, uh, in a way, the prevalence of gambling yeah. among Australians on how it is so widely accepted. Mm. And, and I think also we just see it as normal because it's everywhere, do you know? Um, another statistic that you had that I was um, surprised by, and I probably shouldn't have been surprised by what it was, is that 65% of Australians actually see gambling as recreational, yeah. that it's actually a hobby, uh, it's a sport, it's, it's, it's one of those, it falls into those sort of areas. Yeah, so yeah, so that's right. So I guess it, it, it probably also correlates with how we are all so passionate about our sports in Australia. Yes, and yes. So we all watch like Australian uh, football rules, uh, Australian uh, rule football, rugby, and even tennis uh, at the Australian Open, for example. So there's probably a correlation between those events and also gambling. It's because I guess when you're out with your mates, right, so we all want to take a pun and also enjoy those events together. Mm. It is interesting though when you think about it. Like, and and look, please, you know, hear that I'm I'm not trying to prom- promote gambling here. But <laughs> when you think about thirteen hundred dollars a year, yeah. right? So, and you, if you just said, okay, is it okay to put that level of time and come out thirteen hundred dollars worse off? All right. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there'd be lots of things that the average family would spend on a regular basis that would come to $1,300 a year, all right? So it, it, it is interesting in the sense that, you know, how, how does this become normalised? Well, it's probably ways of explaining it like that. Well, 1300 bucks, you know, that's all right. If I'm only losing that amount of money, right? But, of course, there'd be a lot of people on a huge amount of money that they're losing. Yeah, well, it's, that it's, that's it. It's the average, isn't it? Mm, yes, so there's, there's right. people that are losing thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars, you know? Yes. I mean, I didn't see this in the data, but you might know something. Is there any statistics that talk about the percentage of Australians that actually do gamble? Yeah, so so um, I guess um, we don't have that statistic in a way, but uh, I guess um, uh, as, um, as Steve mentioned earlier that about 65% of Australians actually consider gambling as a recreational activity. So at least 65 of us would have gambled. At least 65% are saying that's that's one of my recreational activities, right? So there's probably another 10 or 15% out there that go, oh, I gamble every now and then, but it's not a hobby. Yeah, yeah, it's it's what I do professionally. That's what I do professionally. (laughs) Yeah, that's right, that's right. And um, look, one of the things I wanted to ask, I mean, I guess that the question that most gamblers and and people that gamble will say is, is, oh, look, you know, we all know that people lose, but I win more than I lose. How does that sort of, you know, from a statistical point of view work? Are there people that win you know, really well in gambling compared to others? Is there, is there a whole lot of losers and a, and a couple of winners? Or does it tend to be that most people that gamble, you know, the house always wins, that, that most people do tend up losing over the long run? Yeah, so I guess from, so that's a really great question because there'll be like this um, misperception or conception that, oh, so if I saw someone winning big bucks on a given night, I could do it. Right? Mm-hmm. So it could happen to me. But uh, from a statistics perspective, I, so we have this uh, law called the law of large number, mm-hmm. right? meaning that if you go over and over and over again, back to gambling, so the house always win because gambling do have a negative payoff. Right? So it could be the case that you get lucky in one particular night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but if you do it over and over again for the, the over the next year or two, then of course the, the statistics is actually biased against you, mm. whereby the house have a much have actually have a positive mm. payoff of winning money from you, whereas you have a negative expected payoff from gambling. Mm. 
Mm. I know that um, my, my grandparents um, on my mother's side used to gamble quite a lot and my mother was a bit against gambling because of that. I remember when I, when I turned 18, she said to me, if you ever if you ever do gamble, as soon as you, if you put your $10 into your pokey or $10, you know, wherever, you, wherever you're doing it, as soon as you win the money back, you've got to put it back in your pocket. <laughs> you know, you've got to win back what you've lost and then you can only gamble what you've what you've won. Yep. And it wasn't long before I realised that, uh, you know, I never came away very often with more than what I hmm. I would put my ten dollars back in my pocket or my fifty dollars back in my pocket, but I didn't often go home with a hundred dollars. Yes, I would often go home with the fifty because I actually put it away. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I would always come back break even. Do you know? So it's very rare that you actually end up with the with the large win. <sighs> But when you do get the large win, you remember it, don't you? Yes, yes, that's right. And then you're going to tell everyone, and which creates this, <laughs> I guess, um, biased statistics about how easy it is to win from mm. gambling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, my story around gambling is that I remember being, I'm guessing I was underage, but um, <laughs> and I'm not sure if I should be admitting that, but and, 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 and it was on a horse, all right? So it was, you know, it was horse racing. And I remember... There was one point where hey, were you riding the horse or were you no, betting no, on no, the horse? No, 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 that's right. And I, I I remember wanting to gamble on a horse, and <laughs> this other guy that was in the TAB or whatever it was went, no, 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 don't go with that one. Go with this one, all right. And so I changed my mind at the last minute and went for the horse that this guy had recommended because he had all the right reasons. <laughs> and then my horse won, all right. And it was you know one of those twenty five to ones and all the rest of it. And I got so angry. So angry. The, the the emotion really was overboiling. I walked out and I never gambled again. Mm. I never gambled because just the emotion that I felt at that point in time, it was it was it was unsustainable. I just couldn't get my head around it. So that I was wonder, it. I wonder what the story would be if you had have said no to him and Gone for the twenty to one odds with the horse, and, well, if it, and your story here is like the first time I gambled at seventeen, I you know I walked yeah. away with two thousand dollars. Well, that's right. Except that probably would have been the beginning of the end because I probably would have, maybe I would have become addicted. Maybe you know that would have been something that I just kept putting more and more and money money into, but losing that whatever it was twenty yeah. bucks or, or on a, on a horse yeah. um, was just enough for me to go. No, nah, I can't do this. I, yeah. I don't have the the the. I don't know, the stamina, the emotion, the mm. control, whatever it was. I mean, I think the thing that's interesting to point out with the recreation thing is that I've got some friends that, um, that, that uh, you know, are involved quite heavily in sport, um, you know, betting on sports, and they do a lot of research, a lot of time and a lot of energy, and they, they're part of clubs and they talk to people. It really is for them quite a social activity. Mm. So from their point of view, I, I could see why they would see it as recreation because mm. it's 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 a hobby for them. Mm. Yeah. Do you know, they have they know all the statistics of, of, you know, which football players are, you know, going to score, who's going to, who's done that, who's done tries, you know, where they're at, whether they're fit, whether they're not fit and and so they feel like they have a, a good understanding of of the game so when they're putting their money down you know there's actually some knowledge and, and research behind it do you know so from their point of view it would be quite a recreational social activity uh just sometimes with a high dollar figure mm -hmm. so you know i think i guess in the end it's about actually setting yourself that budget, isn't it? Yep. And saying, uh, if I see it as, as recreational, as I see it as, as social, if I see it as being fun, I don't spend more than X amount of dollars per week or X amount of dollars per, per month. Mm. Yes, exactly. So it's like um, when you do your budgeting, right? So you're going to put this money aside for your, uh, I guess, hobbies. Mm -hmm. And so it could be, let's say, going to a holiday or it could be, let's say, on gambling. So as long as you don't overstretch yourself and put yourself in a difficult financial position, mm -hmm. so I guess it's fine as long as you can afford to mm -hmm. pay for it. Mm. And I think it's something I've come across with some of the clients that I've done in regards to their budgeting that do gamble. They sort of say, look, I don't want to spend more than $100 a week or I don't want to spend more than you know, X amount of money. And it actually, um, yeah, because we use that data feed where we actually get live data from their bank account so we know exactly what they're spending, uh, even if they're putting it out in cash in the ATM, you can say, hey, what what, what was that $100 for? <laughs> and they've got to say uh, either it was for gambling or it was for, you know, eating, eating McDonald's, but, you know, it probably wasn't for purchasing something, um, you know, it's beneficial so it allows them to actually see what they're spending and i think that's one of the main things when it when it comes to um just cash flow and budgeting in general but particularly in gambling is to be able to go i'm happy with that level of a hundred dollars a week or whatever it is it's when you start going over it and you see that you've done 
200 or 300 or 400 dollars that week that's when you go okay i need to pull myself back and, and and make it more of an effective you know budgeting strategy here yeah so if i can go backwards a step marty so um, you know, I guess in Australia we have this probably phrase that, you know, when it comes to the stock market that, um, you know, I'll, I'll get a lot of people come in that might be more comfortable with property or they might have never invested and they'll go, oh, investing in the stock market is just like gambling, mm. all right? So so where did that sort of connection come from? So obviously you've got a finance background, you study this, right, and then all of a sudden some, some one day some pennies dropped or somebody said something to you that made you start thinking about this this concept of stock market and gambling. Do you remember how that connection came about? Yeah, so yeah, so this probably happened uh, a lot more in recent years when the COVID pandemic, COVID nineteen yes. pandemic started. Mm-hmm. So I do remember back then. So in early two thousand, so I think we have this lockdown from yep. February uh, from March twenty twenty. Yes. So I actually started getting phone call and messages from friends and relative that I don't really know them well, and then they actually started asking me about share investment. <laughs> <laughs> He must know what he's doing. <laughs> yeah, so because I'm an academic or an associate professor in of finance, so, so I started getting all these questions about, hey, is this a good stock or how should I invest in the share market? Now you know how a doctor feels. <laughs> yes, when they yes. get all these relatives from far away going, I've got a lump on my leg. Uh, Steve, just a reminder, he is a doctor. <laughs> That's true. Just a medical doctor, different, different. Yes. So they, have to, they still called him, but for financial problems, That's not right. medical problems. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. So this is when I started to I guess realize that okay so there's probably a correlation between mm. lockdown or COVID pandemic with people actually starting to take more risk than what they would usually be comfortable with mm. because many of these people have no prior experience investing in the share market at all and they actually don't engage or don't seek professional advice and they are hoping to get some free advices of me and so on how to, I guess, invest in the share market, which in fact uh, is actually not the right thing for me to do because um, in order to be providing financial advice, mm. I need to be licensed in a that's way, right. which that's I'm right. not. Mm. Right. So that's why uh, I guess I'm trying to do the right thing and I was trying to guide them to the correct resources <laughs> that, uh, that actually do have um, the license to provide those advices. So it's more about an information session from me rather than an advice Did session. You? Did you have like a, a form at the front of your house where everyone had to sign to say, <laughs> I did not receive financial advice from, you know, Dr. Marty Shah? No, no. <laughs> no, so I, I trust that they won't, I guess, uh, betray me in a way. So, yeah, so but I do tell them that, oh, you probably need to get a, a professional financial advice because this is not something that I would be able to do on your behalf. And then, of course, you're going to say that if you win, the winnings or the gains belong to you. Yes. If you do lose money, you're going to come back to me oh, and totally. seek compensation. Totally, totally. <laughs> so, like um, that research was 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 fasc- fascinating research when you were correlating the COVID nineteen and, and lockdown and, and what happened with gambling. So, um, for those of our listeners that haven't read the research, uh, you started to notice that um, obviously as lockdown happened, you know the the horses stopped running, the dogs stopped running, people stopped playing sport. All of a sudden, all these avenues where people were able to to you know bet and, and do gambling were no longer available. They couldn't go down to their pub for the local pokies. They were unable to you know go down to the casino to, to do that. They're sitting at home, and all of a sudden you notice that there was an increase in in um, I think you called it residential. Um, retail trading volume. Yeah, retail. Sorry, retail trading, yep. which was which was non professionals coming into the market, and for the first time dipping their toe into the into the share market, and uh, and really changing up you know the liquidity in that market. Yep. So so talk us through where did that sort of come from? How did that how did that sort of start? Yeah, so uh, so as well as what I was saying earlier, so I, mm. I started getting phone calls and messages from people that I don't really know well. Mm. So this is why I'm interested to, I guess, uh, examine this empirically yep. in a more formal way uh, about why people actually started to share, at least show some interest in investing in the share market. Yep. So, so you're probably right that because of COVID-19 pandemic, it actually creates a huge shock to how we usually live and I guess I'll spend all days. Right? So in the past, right, so we'll just, I guess, um, if you have an office job, you're going to go from nine to five, Mondays to Fridays. And that's also the time when the Australian stock market is opening. So you probably don't have time to trade in your office 
unless uh, unless you want to be fired by your boss in a way so but because of the covid covid 19 lockdown people are actually starting to work remotely from home mm. so this actually create the uh, created the increase in free time or the time where they are unmonitored in a way by mm. the bosses which they can then potentially do some additional I guess I'll uh, potentially get some additional income through trading in the share market. So it's, it's also right that during those periods, especially in the state of Victoria, where I mm. was there, mm. right? So during the lockdowns, right? So the lockdown is actually really harsh mm. back then. So this is why people actually potentially turn to the share market as a different form of gambling that can be performed from home. And by my research do show that during the COVID lockdown periods, like so if we actually classify the trading volumes into institutional and retail yep. trading volume, right? So we would imagine that on average, right, so there'll be more professionals out there. So which is the case before the COVID pandemic. There are more institutional trading volumes yep. right before COVID. But what's really surprising is that since the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, right, so the volume of retail trading actually overtook those of uh, institutional investing, uh, in institutional investor, which is surprising. And the institutional investing, the professional investor, they, they didn't drop their volume. It just all of a sudden, yeah, you know, they kept their similar sort yep. of volume, but but this retail volume, this this you know, the average mum and dad, all of a sudden have, has increased, you know, the volume that's actually coming into the share market. Yes, exactly. So uh, on top of my head, so I can't remember the exact uh, numbers, but I believe that uh, from my paper, like so, the institutional trading volume did increase by about ten to twenty percent from memory, mm. but the retail volume actually increased by more than sixty percent, which is really substantial. So, Marty, like in regards to that as a statistic, what, what was the volume of that, you know? Yeah, so, so um, in, in my paper, I showed that before the COVID pandemic, so on average, right, so on a daily basis, about um, 1.5 million shares changed hand by, yep. uh, then by retail investors. But the, uh, during COVID, so, so during the lockdown, so this number actually um, increased by more than twice. So actually wow. over 3 million shares actually change hand on every day because of the increase in retail trading volume. So again, it actually shows that uh, the, due to the lockdown for various reasons, right? So retail investors actually started trading way more than what, what, what they usually do before the pandemic. Yeah. And do you think that that trend has continued or was it just a COVID thing and it stopped or do you think, no, nope, it's here to stay now? Yeah, so I guess um, what what I do believe is that uh, this trend, uh, so this abnormally high trading volume by retail investors is not going to stay yeah. because now people are not locked away mm -hmm. in their house, right? So they have, uh, they probably want to go up way more than what they are. Uh, what they used to do during the COVID lockdown, right? So it's not expected to continue. And I do believe that um, as after the lift of the restriction, trading volume has returned back to a more uh, back to a level that's more comparable to the uh, pre-COVID-19 period. Having said that, right, so there are actually uh, about 435,000 people or investors who entered the share market for the first time during the pandemic, right? So some of these people would probably stay because now they have actually, I guess, get some taste of what it means to invest and they have gained some uh, additional financial literacy as well through that, mm. right? So even though trading volume would probably return to a more reasonable level because it is indeed abnormal during COVID period, but there'll be, um, so there'll be more uh, investors out there who have already have some form of training experience. Mm -hmm. And I think to add to that, uh, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on this, Marty, but you've talked about time being a reason why um, people invested and, and just having too much time. Um, but from memory, I think that the savings rate, because of how much money the government injected into yeah. society, yeah. people had more money yes. than they've had since I think it's the like the 1970s in terms mm. of the savings rate. Mm. So, and given where we are now from a interest rate and, and cost of living perspective and that sort of thing, um, you know, I'm guessing this, the, the, just naturally the, the economic times have cleaned a lot of people out from that in terms of who's still in there and who's not. The disposable income type thing. Well, disposable income, so it's a time thing, it's a disposable income thing, but it's also a, like the 12 months that we've just had in the stock market um, weren't great. 
Yeah. Right. So mm-hmm. if if you weren't really serious at developing a stock market strategy, right, you've probably gone, oh, that that's a bit ugly. <laughs> I'm not going back there again. It hurts. It hurt, it hurt a lot of people. So, um, so yeah. Any sort of thoughts on that, Marty? Yeah. So that's a, so uh, Hamish, you actually raised a number of good potential reasons on why people actually started to trade a lot more during the mm-hmm. lockdown. First, right. So there's a very very stimulus provided by the mm. government. And then at, at the same time, the cash rate was at 0.1%, mm. meaning that people are not getting that much interest if they just choose to save their money in a term deposit. Mm. Right? So this is why people actually started to seek alternative places whereby they could potentially generate a greater return. Right. And then, right, so during COVID pandemic, of course, we have experienced a huge decrease in share market. So um, back in March, for example, share market on ASX actually decreased by 50 percent. Right. So so this actually creates, I guess, uh, opportunity for investors to bargain hunt. Mm -hmm. And so back then you could probably just invest in any given stocks during that year of 2020 and you would have made some decent Mm -hmm. returns. Mm. in that given year right so so which is also what motivated investors to trade mm. of course as Hamish just mentioned right so if you actually started trading let's say from last year to now right so you probably will be spooked yes. by the share market yes. because it's not really doing that well because of high interest rate right so because of high interest rate and other factors and uh, and due to the high interest rate people are also starting to put their money in term deposit because they'll be more satisfied with that saving rates now mm-hmm. compared to during covid and so were a lot of people was it mainly interday trading or was it um you know buy and hold so so um so from, from my experience, again, from friends and relatives who asked me those questions during COVID-19, so they probably don't know too much about share market in um, to the extent that uh, it's a long-term investment game. Mm-hmm. So those who entered at those times probably think of the share market as a get-rich-quick scheme, yes. whereby they can get in and out quickly and earn, let's say, over 50% return over a short period. But we know that uh, this is not how the share market works, right? So if we look at the statistics on the share market over a long period of, let's say, uh, the past 20 or 30 years, share market on ASX on average generated a return of, let's say, somewhere between 8 to 12%, mm. right? So this is why um, the COVID period also created this unrealistic expectation for new investors that they could actually generate huge return over a short period of time. Mm. Mm. And it w- was most of the volume, you know, could you see from your brochures that, that, that a lot of that uh, retail volume was coming in and out or, you know, was it staying in the market? Yeah, so there's a greater turnover in yes. the retail trading, meaning that people actually started to change hands yeah. in terms of that shares at a much quicker rate compared to before. So it did show, so my research did show that the turnover has increased during the COVID period, meaning that there is more, or there's actually more intraday or daily trading activities going on during the COVID period compared to before. Yep. Mm. And uh, I'm not sure what, you know, when your research stopped or what you've been looking at statistic-wise since then, but um, has that, once lockdown finished, once everything turned back to normal, once life started, once the share market started to tank, you know, in, in 2022, um, you can, know. Can we use the word correct rather than sorry? Right, sorry, <laughs> sorry. So <laughs> once the share market started to correct in 2022, uh, you know, have we seen a reduction? Has, has it sort of gone back to what it was before? Yes, sir. It has definitely. So mm-hmm. trading volume has returned to a level that's more comparable to pre-COVID period. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting. Just and, and if you, please tell me if you think I'm wrong here, Marty. But you know, I think the word correct is. I'm not just being. You know, I was being cheeky, but you know, in terms of because. What 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 I've really learned out of this report as well is that so 2021. In 2020 was mm. a pretty good year for the stock market, yes. mm. but it, but it, it was a you know what I'm now starting to think is okay. So um, it was good for some good reasons and some real reasons, but there was possibly this artificial stimulation in the yep. stock market that actually um, expend you know pushed the market higher than might mm. have yep. normally done because this wasn't just an Australian phenomenon, was yes. it? It was a it was a worldwide phenomenon in some ways. Yes. 
So you're right. So so uh, this phenomenon of increased retail attention in share market probably originated from the US from the Robinhood trading platform. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so whereby there's just increase in retail trading um, volume in the US that actually translate into other countries as well, like Australia. So this also, I guess, this is also related to the um, prominence of those online trading platforms that is similar to Robinhood, whereby um, I'm not sure whether you have seen some of those platforms before. They do look and they do look like a gambling um, platform or a poker machine oh, where everything is really colorful and everything is about based on visualization. Yes. So that's why it actually, I guess, uh, encourages people to trade because it's so easy to click a buy button or a sell button through those platforms. Mm. Mm. And um, in regards to uh, crypto, um, so your research didn't didn't specifically look at crypto; it was specifically looking at the share market. But during that time, uh, you know, crypto went 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 you know through the roof and went crazy during that time. Didn't I mean? But before COVID, uh, there wasn't a lot of talk about it. If if someone talked about crypto, they were really into it. Do you yeah. know, what I mean, it was a passion for them. Uh, it was their hobby. It was their you know what they what they did. Whereas through COVID, everything changed, didn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so I guess uh, um, yeah, so you you actually make a really good point that um that I also want to uh, bring back to Hamish earlier point about uh, the artificial stimulus provided by government at that time. Mm-hmm. So people have a lot of money, but uh, the saving rate or the cash rate is really low at that time, right? So in finance, there's we always know that there's this inverse relationship between price and interest rate. So when interest rate decreases, prices would increase. So there's always this um, inverse relationship that we know already. And we know that, oh, back in um, 2020, right, so cash rate was at 0.1%, which in theory, and which also work in practice, it actually pushes up the um, prices of various risky assets, including share market and crypto market, because um, those assets are the ones that's also sensitive to economic conditions. Yes. So when things go well, Right, so those assets will actually increase in value way more. Yep. Right, but when things don't go well, as what we are seeing now, so there'll be a correction mm. or I guess a reduction in share price because now interest rate has increased to a, a level that's I guess more um more comparable to the traditional level, mm. even though it's uh, higher than uh, average now. Mm. Mm. And this is you talk about 2020 but in terms of just generally for the audience um you know if we think on a global scale then money's moving all over the world based on which countries are offering better exchange rates and and which markets are seem to be cheap versus expensive and things like that so so it's 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 pro- would i be right in saying that it, it's new for this to be a retail phenomenon, but from a wholesale phenomenon, sort of moving around the, the money, is, is, it's been around for a while. Um, so, um, but, you know, this, this you're right, there's this concept of saying, well, what is a reasonable return for the current market is really, I guess, the, you know, to me what you're saying as well, and this is a bit of a penny drop moment for me, is sort of going, well, okay, so... Um, from a risk return point of view, which is something that you talked about before, there's these long-term averages. And whenever markets are behaving that's unusual, mm. right, you, you really have to ask yourself the question why, all right? Yep. So um, because generally there's something going on yep. that the average person can't see. W- would you agree with that? Yeah, so you're right. So I guess uh, it goes back to, I guess, the importance of, I guess, doing research and understanding mm. the long-term, I guess, trend of what you get yourself into, right? So uh, earlier I've mentioned about uh, retail investors back in 2020 having this unrealistic expectation of getting rich in a really short Mm -hmm. period of time. We know that that's not the case and that's what our institutional investors also know. Mm -hmm. So this is why the increase in trading volume is actually more, uh, I guess, more um, normal for institutional investors compared to retail traders, mm. whereby they all just started to pump or put more money in the share market due to, I guess, um, the unrealistic expectation about returns. Mm. And of course, right, so those investors are probably the category that is also um, not familiar with the risk and return trade-off. Right? So if you get a really good return in a given year, probably, so if we, if we think about the long-term average, it's probably going to be closer to average over the, a longer-term period. Mm. Sorry, Marty, I know Steve asked a question about 
cryptocurrency before and just how that fitted in. So I think I stole you away for there for a little while. So did we cover off on that question, Steve? Uh, yeah, I think we did. But I mean, look, you know, I, I found the um, phenomenal of, of, of the phenomenon of cryptocurrency quite quite interesting over that period of time. I mean, everybody was talking about it. Um, I mean, goodness me, I think my parents even brought it up in a, in a subject. I didn't even know they knew what, what it was, let alone to ask a question about it. Mm. Um, and so, so many people were getting involved, do you know? Um, and I think that leads me to, to my next question in regards to, to Finfluencers. So, uh, all of a sudden around COVID, we had these Finfluencers that, that had been there before, but they really came to the, to the forefront during that period of time. Um, how much did Finfluencers affect you know, the stock market, uh, affect the crypto market, affect the property market? I mean, where did they sort of come into? Yeah, so so um, so that's actually uh, a survey conducted back in 2021 mm -hmm. by, um, by um, I believe, um, don't hold me to that, I believe this is a survey conducted by ASIC mm -hmm. that shows that during 2021, right, so um, about 28% of young people followed at least a influencer. And out of those uh, people who at least follow a influencer, 65% of them, so about two thirds of them actually change their uh, financial behaviors. So this actually shows that, um, right, so young people's trading or financial behaviors did change because of these influencers. So they started, for example, investing or they started following the advice or information given by those influencers in, re in relation to their investment or I guess a spending habit. Mm -hmm. So almost one in five young people change their behaviours. Yes. Um, because of influence. So twenty eight percent. So about let's say one third, mm. like close to one third, mm. followed a influencer during that period, mm. and sixty five. So two third of them change their financial behaviours mm. as a result. And you know, as time went on, we started to realise that. Um, you know, a lot of influencers weren't just, you know, a they weren't professionals. Yeah. Um, so they 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 were just sprouting information they picked up or what they thought wasn't actually, you know, professional advice um, was firstly. But secondly, uh, it turned out a lot of them were actually being paid to, to give this advice to, to actually support other industries as well. Yeah, so exactly. So I guess um, uh, in a way, there's no free lunch. So there must be a reason or a motive on why influencers or people will start giving advice for free yeah. on the internet through social media platform like TikTok or Instagram, right? So there are two, I guess, widely accepted reasons on why they might want to do that. First, as you mentioned, Steve, so it's, it's, it's about, I guess, getting those um, additional collaboration opportunities like sponsored content mm -hmm. or speaking events or even the chance to write a book, yes. right? And um, another reason is that they might actually engage in this behavior called um, pump and dump. Right, so whereby they encourage of uh, their followers to purchase shares that they have personal interest in. Yes. Right, so this actually uh, inflated the share price because yep. with greater demand, right, so share price would increase. Right, so which would, which would which they would then uh, profit at the expense of those uh, followers. Mm. Mm. Right, so I guess it's really important for I guess followers or young people to also understand their motive and of course the background whether they have a uh, related um, background is also important, right? So um, at the same time, it is important to for us to know that there must be some reasons on why people are giving financial advice for free at that time, right? So it's probably, uh, so those influencers are probably not telling you the entire truth about how they succeeded unless they are also giving you advice on how they succeeded as a influencer. Mm. Mm -hmm. And look, I, you know, I think there's lots of stories where, uh, you know, I've been sort of that pump and dump ideas, particularly with crypto. Yeah. You know, they, they, they buy coins quite low. They would then, um, you know, uh, get out there and, and, and really push uh, that coin. They would watch it go up. To, to the high, they would then get out yep. uh, and then they'll stop promoting it. Yes. And it wasn't long before it would actually just, just dump and take after that. Sorry, correct. <laughs> oh, no, when it comes to crypto, you can use dump. Right? Oh, can I use dump and take for crypto? <laughs> right. uh, okay, hang on. There's some bias 
that's coming yeah, out. Yeah, a little bit of bias, yes, yeah. that's right. So, yeah. so maybe those freelancers should be actually giving advice on how to be a successful freelancer. Yes, that's right, <laughs> right, that's right, rather than on, rather than on crypto markets. Yeah. So look, Hamish, um, you know, from your point of view, you, you've got a financial background. You've had to do lots of study to, to be able to uh, have a financial license, uh, and there's a lot that you have to do to uh, regulations-wise to be able to give financial advice. Um, can you help our you know listeners understand uh, what happened there with influencers who literally had uh, no background, no professional, uh, were, were you know some were doing this pump and dump, and and some were being paid by third parties to you know to encourage uh, behaviour. Um, the government corrected that, so can you just talk us through how that happened? Yeah, well, I guess um, so. Essentially, after the Royal Commission. Um, it, it created a vacuum in the marketplace. So there was there was a lot of people that were giving advice that were, um, I guess, maybe not removed is the right word, but ended up exiting the industry for a variety of reasons. And so the, the problem is, is then, is that people still wanted to get guidance from somewhere. Okay, so if I can't go to a, an advisor, if I can't go here, if I can't go there, naturally most of us these days will start looking on the internet for oh. some sort of solution, all right? So, um, and obviously these guys, um, you know, or people, you know, started going, well, there's an opportunity here. You know, there's an opportunity to fill this void. And I'm sure that there were some people, and I, I, I know one podcast in particular where there's a, a young guy who it feels like his motives are good, like he's actually trying to say this is ridiculous, there's no one out there to give advice anymore, I'm going to do my best to provide support to people that are looking for guidance. And look, one of the best known books that's probably been around the last five years has been and maybe even longer than that is The Barefoot Investor, mm. which is, you know, again, it's it's something that has been incredibly successful because of, um, you know, how it was promoted and that sort of thing. And there's, you know, the, the guy that wrote that book, Scott Pape, you know, he's, he's, it, you know I, I've typically said to people, look, you know, 70 to 80 percent of the content in there is good. Um, you know, you just have to be careful because, again, it's general. It's not, you know, specifically for your circumstances. So this va vacuum got created. Um, and then obviously, you know, asset comes along and, and mm -hmm. um, sort of goes, oh, wait a second, we've got a problem here. All right. So um, and they've, they've then tried to sort of say, well, wait a second, we need to stamp this out because the principle of giving advice, you know, like Marty mentioned before, is that you've got to have insurance, you've got to have the right qualifications. There's got to be structure to this mm -hmm. um, because it's the lack of structure well, in the past that's gone horribly wrong. And I think access really important to, to, to stop and, and note. Uh, here is someone who's got a doctor in uh, you know in finances and in financial accounting and so forth and he's going I'm not a financial advisor mm -hmm. and I can't give financial advice mm -hmm. you know there's there's good reasons why uh, the government has has allocated certain people to be able to do that they have the right licenses the right insurance the right ability uh, you know to go from there oh and look you know the reality is you know in respect to yourself and the journey you've been on from an education point of view, I think if we stack the letters up next to our name, Marty would have more letters next to his name than what I do, right? So To start off with, he has a D and an R. Right, that's right. right. <laughs> So, so you know, but but I think if we sat down and talked about the the education that we've had, there's been a difference, you know. Like, mm. you know, I think you used the word academic in the past, Marty. You know, so so the the the, the research, the analysis, the that that skill that you've developed over time, you know, is is different. Whereas the skill that, you know, I've been, you know, encouraged to go on or have gone on is is can, trying to take some of that information yeah. but then blend the, the, the relational skills and the human psychology that, that actually comes with it. Mm. So, you know, it's, you know, in all honesty, I've been eyeing off Marty saying, I wonder if I can afford to get him in the business, you know. <laughs> they, they probably can't, but, you know, so... Um, <laughs> So coming back to the question, though, so obviously, you know, ASIC's come in and said we've got this bias, mm. you know, we've got this this problem that's occurring. How do we stamp this out and and how do we bring back this structure that we've been trying to to enforce really mm. since the Royal Commission? Mm. And Finfluencers, just like a lot of careers, you know, it, it's, it's it's you might say I know how a loan works, I know how an offset account works, I know how the stock market works, but unless you apply all of the bits and pieces that we've had to go through to bring together this service that you call it and, and you know it, it it's it is it's 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 and and 
it's dangerous to try and do it without the right skill set. Mm. Um, and it's also, it's such an important part of society is to manage money, mm. right? It's on everybody's fingertips, you know, mm. like uh, you know, on, on the tip of our tongue, you know, like how do we make sure people retire well? How do we make sure that if we earn a dollar, we get to keep that money and we mm. put it in the right way? And, and there is a lot of competition to that fights against that. Um, so let's, let's go through. So... Royal Commission, what year was that? 2018. So 2018, Royal Commission comes in and says, okay, if you want to be a financial advisor, this is now the level yep. of financial advice you have to give because mm-hmm. there's been too many people out there taking money and not giving good advice or not enough advice. Mm-hmm. And so they, they, they make a, a standard and they say, right, you have to attain that standard. So all of a sudden in the financial market uh, or financial advice market, lots of people leave because they go, oh, I just can't run a business that way, mm-hmm. do you know? Uh, those that stay are saying, right, to be able to give you financial advice, I now need to charge $6,000 minimum type mm. thing. Uh, yeah, you can probably drop it a little bit, but right. it's, it's become a lot more expensive. It's become a lot more expensive. And so there's all these people left that, that, that aren't ready for that level of advice. Mm. Uh, they've lost the, the the smaller advice or the, the more general advice that's at a, at a cheaper level. And that's created this power vacuum where, uh, where influencers has been able to come in and say, hey, I can actually help you, you mm. do that. And so here we are now, you know, five years later from the Royal Commission or four and a half, five years later from the Royal Commission, and the government has only just recently said, hey, we've we've lost a large percentage of our financial advisors. Um, financial advice is now really expensive. Uh, you know, while we while we feel like we've created a really robust industry, we've we've actually destroyed it in certain ways as well. Do you know what I mean? The level of advice is great. The professionalism is great, but the access is, is you know, dismal. Mm. And so um, I think I just read an article just recently that the Abilese government is actually saying, right, we need to actually encourage new financial advisors. We need to work out new rules so that financial advisors don't have to, you know, be at a certain level to, mm. to charge that amount of money. They actually can, uh, you know, legally uh, talk in, in more general terms with people. So h- how do you think that's going to change your industry? Uh, look, I think um, I think it's still on a trajectory that's good, mm. right, because I think, um, you know, you, you talk about, and this is going to sound like a weird example, but, you know, people post-World War II you know, for 20 or 30 years, everyone just probably thought about World War II, you mm. know, like they, they, they just didn't want to go back to that time, you know. Oh. So I can tell you right now that the Royal Commission and the last five years has been um, scarred into everyone mm. in the financial services industry's brains. Mm. Right? There's just no going back to where we were because of the journey. I mean, you know, look, not to make too much of this, but there's been financial advisors commit suicide Right, mm. because they couldn't cope with the, the speed and the level of change that the government put us under. So it, it, there's, there's actually a really damaging side to this that, um, that that nobody wants to go back there. So so in terms of that educational standard and making sure that that the people understand, well, now this is a this is we, you know we've gone from what's called a, an occupation to on the journey to becoming a profession. I don't know if that's something you've uh, heard that phrase mm. before. And so you know the, the calling of a profession is to say how do we give back to the community how do we make sure that that what we're doing um actually benefits people right? mm. so which is very different to you know w- w- you know say what if influencer does or what mm. even advisors would have done 10 years ago mm. so 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 sorry if it's a long-winded answer but yeah i, I don't think I, I don't think anyone's going to go, want to go back to the old days very quickly yeah. all right so but the, you know there's all these conflicting things like you know um, okay what does good advice look like does it have to be an 80 page document yes or, that's right all right that's so right. Um, what does scalable advice looks like and, and even from the point of view a 24 year old doesn't want an 80 page document mm. no yeah. yeah they don't want to pay for it they don't want it they don't want to read it mm. you know so so it's about going where's the market for that and currently there isn't a market for that and hence why the the influencer phenomenon was able to actually you know take off but um, look, moving moving away from influencers and, and going back to your study, um, when these Australians, the average Australians during COVID, started dipping their feet, you know, into this market, uh, all of these the retail volume uh, was it 
end up by how yeah. much? Yeah. Two, more than fifty percent. More than fifty percent. Yeah. Um, did did Australians make money? Did they lose money? I mean, what happened there? You know, the market was obviously rising. So, like you said, anyone who did a half decent trade was probably going to do okay during that uh, you know two thousand and twenty. Yeah. Um, but what were the what were the results in the end? So, uh, so that's actually a good point because uh, even before the pandemic, we so there's already various research in the states and also in Australia that shows that retail investors are actually not that good if they choose to day trade. <laughs> On average, they're yes. going to lose money, which is not surprising yes. because they're not professional investors. Yes. So this only shows that during the pandemic, because of the magnified uh, trading volume by retail investors, any losses would be magnified as a yes. result. So my my study actually shows that um, this is actually the case. Right? So what I did is that I actually uh, I classify stocks into stocks that most retail investors bought yeah. and to, uh, into like uh, stocks that not many invest, retail investors are interested. Yeah. And I look at their return over the next 10 days. So this would give an indication of how much you would be able to earn yes. if you choose to trade in a short period of time. So I actually find that if you actually uh, build your portfolio based on stocks that most retail investors bought, you are actually going to lose 7% just over the next 10 days. Yes. So this actually shows the danger of trading um, trading, uh, I guess, intraday trading, meaning that uh, on average, even though we know that if we hold it over a longer period during that year of 2020, you would benefit. But if you choose to day trade, right, so there's an average wealth of 7% uh, if you buy stocks that most other retail investors bought as well. Mm. Right, so if you look at the other spectrum, whereby um, uh, those contain the the stocks that not many retail investors are interested in. So this portfolio of stocks actually generated a positive return of 7%. Yep. So again, it shows that retail investors, or uh, if they choose to day trade, they actually don't have the skill to pick the right stock because stocks that they pick generated negative return over 10 day period and stocks that they don't like actually generated a positive return yeah. over the same period of 10 days. So, Marty, can I quote you from now on that if you take on a financial advisor, that your return will jump by 14%? <laughs> <laughs> so, if you if could... Be careful can... what you say here now, Marty. <laughs> yeah, so, so, that's what my research shows. If you could day trade over that short period of 10 days, right? so this is what p yeah. would potentially happen. But as you all know, yeah. right, so you, will have all, you will all have this disclaimer as well. Past performance is not an it's indication not indicator of future, future performance. performance. <laughs> So look, here's a question I wanted to ask you, and, and actually for both of you, this should, this should be a good question. I think the average person, the average retail trader actually doesn't know what a professional trader does, what they actually go into. Um, can you give us a bit of insight, you know, the difference between, say, a retail trader who reads something in the paper, sees a influencer, or, you know, Uncle Bob says... Oh, I reckon BHP is going to do well. Mm. Do you know what's the difference between that compared to what a professional actually does do? Do you want me to go first or would you like mm. to? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. okay. So I think the, the first thing is that um, what most professional investors are doing is they're actually looking at each individual company that they're trading in and saying, okay, do I? what's my strategy here? All right, so you'll get phrases that... Um, investors will use like I, I'm more interested in income all right and and I'll buy companies based on the, the, the evaluation method yeah. all right and then you'll get other investors that will talk about I don't really need income or I'm not I don't believe that this current season is suitable for evaluation method I want to go with a growth method all right so and and both are you know without sort of going too far down this this rabbit hole you know both have very different philosophies for different points of time so mm -hmm. so you know 10 years ago all right if you sat down and said i believe in a growth method um, you would have gotten it right and you would have been quite mm -hmm. successful mm -hmm. all right so um, the challenge is in this next 10 years is it, is it still does it suit more of a growth orientation or should um, people be looking at more of a valuation or a value 
you know, um, methodology, all right? So, and, you know, I can't, I just can't explain those concepts. In, no, you know. no, but I, I guess what I'm trying to get to as well, though, is, is even the fact that, that people understand that there are actually theories mm. around this. There's, there's, there's a thought process around it that one professional compared to another or one company compared to another will actually decide that that is the way we're going to move mm. forward. And then behind that is all the research, uh, you know, and, and and computer programs and simulations and whatever else that goes into actually making them decide where that is. I mean, even something as simple as going, uh, you know, you made that comment, they, they evaluate the business. Uh, an average retailer, you know, the average mum and dad can't evaluate a business. Yeah. I mean, what are the sort of things they're looking at when they evaluate a business? So uh, I guess um. So for an average mom and dad investor, they probably would buy stocks that receive greater spotlight yes. by the media, for example. Yes. So there's also, I guess, um, um, number of research that shows that um, mom and dad or retail investors, they tend to like to buy stocks that are close to their 52-week high yes. because this is something that's uh, quite accessible to, let's say, Yahoo Finance. So, um, But we know that our past prices is probably not an indication of how the future price would be. So there'll be like, I guess, more um, more this for retail investors, they are probably going to base their trading base on feeling yes. or hunch a lot yes. more. Compared what they've read. To, yes, yes, what they've read. Yeah, that's right. And um, uh, they probably have this uh, simplified version of what's a good stock and what's a bad stock. So there's just two categories of good or bad. But even though right, so for professional investors, there'll be like a spectrum of let's say one to 10. If you look at um, the spectrum from good to bad, right? So it's not a, uh, I guess, by, it's not a um, two category only for yeah. professional investors. And uh, as Hamish mentioned, right? So professional investors do talk about those various trading strategies, and there'll be a lot of research and back testing that's done, right? So um, Hamish mentioned about the difference between value strategy versus growth strategies. And there's also some other strategies, like let's say evaluating a uh, company structure in terms of the quality of the business, whether that's a good business overall, based on a composite measure of different aspects of qualities. And of course, there's also some professional investors, for example, who might prefer to have exposure to small stocks or large stocks, mm. or let's say um, momentum trading. So all these actually require a lot of research and back testing that uh, probably a typical retail investors do not have the resources or mm. do not, uh, they are not built to develop those skills and trade based on those skills. So I guess moving forward, Hamish, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a retail investor. I'm, a, I'm an average mum and dad. I want to invest in the stock market. I, I've, I've been listening to Marty and I don't want to lose 7%, let alone have a 14% difference. So I, I, I want to invest, but I don't know where I go from here. So tell us, what what is the best way forward for the average person to invest their, their savings in, in, um, in the stock market? So I guess you know, the first thing is to ascertain whether this is the right time for you because any strategy you put in place usually requires a commitment over time. Yep. So if you just said to me, I've got 10 grand, but I need it back in 12 months' time, what should I do with it? Well, the reality is mm -hmm. that's a very hard thing mm -hmm. to say. It's, it's appropriate to do that right now. But if you're in a position where you've got reasonable cash flow and you, you're ready to invest, you know, let's make that assumption. That then the first thing we would do is, and, and Marty mentioned this before, we try and measure your appetite for risk, all right? And whether you're more focused on um, or, or whether what is best for you is growth or income. All right. So, um, and and for a lot of people, it's a mix of both. But mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, retirees typically are more focused on income. Younger people, you, you become a little bit more focused on growth. Yep. All right. So, as a as a stereotype. So then, you, you but you, you've got to get that mix right. So it's and it's thinking. Okay, do we just want to invest in Australia? Do we want to invest something overseas? Do we want to invest? You know, um, and so for us, we're trying to put together 
I call it a strategy that has this mix, all right? So, you know, we'll hear this word diversification get bandied around, but, you know, whether you call it a mix or a diversified, you know, portfolio, it's trying to get something that has a, a has a range so that if the market drops, that you're not all in one space, all right? So, so am I doing that? Am I choosing the companies or, or you know, are you using managed funds or what are you actually doing to, well, to it can put that be $10,000? Yep. I'm happy to leave it there for 10 years. I'm, I'm average risk taker. You know, where do you sort of go? Yeah, so I mean, uh, we probably tend to use managed funds more than shares, right? yep. um, but I'm licensed to do direct shares. But you'll probably find that there are stockbrokers or other types of advisors that might be more suitable if you want a direct shares strategy. Mm. Um, you know, typically what I say to people is you just have to appreciate that a direct shares strategy needs you to really be sit, sit behind the wheel because you're going to be asked to make all of the major decisions. <laughs> so a managed fund is more set up for you to be able to go, all right, I don't want to make all those decisions because yeah. I'll probably be more like a retail investor and I'll get them all wrong. Yeah. All right, so set me up with something where other people are doing a lot of the grunt work for me and and all I have to do is commit and continue with the strategy. So I think a lot of people's fear is that there's a high cost involved in that. Mm. They hear professionals, they hear all this research, they hear all this stuff, they go, here's my $10,000, I'm putting it in a managed fund. I mean, you know, from a cost versus reward ratio, what, what sort of happens for the average person? So, yeah, look, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, the first start of is you need the education. So you might feel like it's a little bit expensive to start off with because you don't know what you're doing, all right? So, but the, the logic is, is that if you put the right strategy in place and you've got the right time frame, and you allocate that initial cost over the length of the investment, then, then it, it should become affordable if the advisor is doing the right thing by you, mm. right? You know, and again, it, it, there is some economies of scale, you know, the bigger you go, right? And that's the problem with advice at the moment. Um, you know, but, you know, long term, what I expect to see is models come out where it does bring the cost down, hopefully, especially with this review coming out, that they will allow for, um, you know, um, investments to be put in place for lower values that don't have the same cost as what they do today. Because there's not as much oversight required for them. Well, yes. Like I know that uh, ASIC at one point in time talked about there should be a different set of rules if the amount to be invested is under $10,000 versus over $10,000. Okay. But that rule's sort of been lost in all of the post-Royal Commission you know, um, stuff that's been going on. Yeah. So, so yeah, there should be, I believe, there should be, you know, a subset of rules that says if you're only investing this much, it's a lower risk. We don't have to have the complexity that we do if you're investing a much higher amount of money. Yeah, yeah 100%. Um, so, um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's just, it's, the managed funds, I think, suit more retail investors simply because it takes a lot of that emotion and that um, that risk of, of individual behaviour mucking up the portfolio. Would you agree with that, Marty? Yes, so I think uh, I do agree with you, Hamish, and this is also shown uh, in, in prior research yeah. that uh, if if you, as a in retail investor, if you don't know what what or how to start is probably best to start with something that follows the market mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah because it will be far more difficult to perform stock picking mm -hmm. because most people or most mom and dads would not have this skill to mm -hmm. begin with so instead of i guess trying to develop a strategy that aim to outperform the index or the yes. market right, so probably the best return that you can get is the market rate of return by mimicking or following the benchmark. So that probably can be a great starting point, mm. as Hamish mentioned. Right, so have creating this or following those management with diversified portfolio of stocks that try to mimic rather than beat the market performance. Absolutely. Ooh. And uh, also, I guess I also want to add um, um, that this also goes into the difference between active and passive trading. Mm. Right, so uh, I think uh, Hamish might have mentioned as well, if we trade more, right, so the transaction cost mm. might become um, uh, quite significant, yes. which which is also why, right? So probably, um, right? So this is shown by research as well, right? So over the long time, a more passive trading strategy that mimics the market benchmark is probably the best starting point as we gain more and more financial literacy or training skill. That's when we can then start to maybe perhaps consider some of the active stock selection skill in order to complement our, our passive managed one portfolio. Great.
Well, look, I'm going to whiplash you a little bit and take you back to the beginning of the podcast. So in, in, in wrapping up what we've been talking about, um, we started off talking about gambling and I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, with all of your research and all of that you, what you've been doing, uh, do you think that, um, you know, uh, there's a big call for more regulations around gambling, uh, then there's the other call for more education around gambling. Do you think that it's either or or it's sort of both? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think, uh, of course, right, so if the sole purpose is to reduce uh, gambling loss or gambling, addictive gambling gambling problem among Australians, of course, there's things that government can do in terms of interventions, right? So, for example, um, making it more difficult to assess those gambling opportunities, right, or having, like, let's say, uh, treating addictive gambling as a public health problem, whereby there'll be, like, counselling services available for people who face those um. Uh, I guess over gambling problem. So, but at the same time, uh, I guess for for us, right? So as individuals, it is also important for us to understand about the, I guess the problem associated with gambling. Right? So it is fine. So if you if you think of gambling as a fun and exciting uh, hobby, so of course, right? So you can do that as part of your hobby as long as you can manage it. Right, so the problem is addictive or, or over gambling, whereby we're actually over gambling to the extent that it actually costs us our life saving or to it actually put it is put us in a really bad financial position that we can't actually pay out pay our debt obligations due to over gambling. Mm-hmm. Right. So for me personally, so I've mentioned earlier as well that I know that gambling on average comes with a negative expected payoff. So this is why personally gambling is not probably it's not something that I would do as an academic in finance. And second, I don't find gambling as a fun and exciting activity myself. So that's not that's probably not something that I'll be able to do. Right. So of course I'm not saying that we should not gamble. Right. So I'm I'm just saying that if you think of it as a fun activity, as a thing about uh um think about it from your own personal perspective about how it can be affordable or how gambling spendings actually fits within your budget as a hobby. Mm. And if I can add to that, I, I totally agree. And I think probably from what I hear, one of the biggest mistakes that we can make is we call something an investment but it's not an investment, it's a lifestyle decision. Mm. Right? So um, we call something an income generating activity like gambling, it's really a lifestyle activity, mm. right? So so having that, that you know, um, ability to really categorise it properly and uh, to, to an extent, for most of us, don't kid yourself, you know, mm. that's really what it comes down to, um, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Well, look, I've really enjoyed having you. Thank you so much for coming and talking to us about uh, gambling, talking about the share market and, and you know, trading, uh, what happened during COVID and, and even, you know, dipping our toes into, into Finfluencers as well. We've, we've covered a lot of topics today, yeah. but I really appreciate you coming along. So so thank you so much for coming. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Marty. Appreciate Pleasure it. to be here. Now, we do have a question we do ask all of our guests. Uh, so two questions. Firstly, what would you tell your 18-year-old self if you could go back and, and sit down with him, what would you say? Yeah, so so that's a good question because um yeah, so eighteen when I was eighteen, that's probably uh the time when I was kind of trying to be a perfectionist, mm. whereby I want everything to work out the way that I want that I want. Yes. So and then of course as we grow older we start to realize that that's not going to happen. Right? So we don't get all the big wins in life. So, so this is why I'll probably tell my 18 years old self to be kind to myself yeah. right? and um, and to trust that every one of us will have our own unique path mm. right? Yes. So to, to succeed. So there's no one set path and yes. there's no one set way to be successful or to be happy in life. Yes. Right. And I'll also probably tell myself that uh, don't worry too much. Uh, just live at the present and believe that everything will work out at the end one way or another. Right. So of course, right. So it comes, uh, so you need to, I guess, be motivated mm-hmm. and you also need to know what your ultimate life goal is yes. at the end. Right. So of course, right. So ultimately, right. So we want to work towards a certain goal, but what's also important is that we also should enjoy the journey. Yes. So if life is not about what's at the end only. Mm-hmm. So the journey towards that goal or that path is also something that's, that we should all enjoy. 
Mm. <laughs> Fantastic yes. answer. And the other question is, if you were going to write a book, what would it be on and what would the title be? Okay, I'm going to start to sound like a boring <laughs> academic. <laughs> right, so so as, as, uh, as Steve mentioned earlier, I've written over 20 academic articles. So probably writing a book is not my big agenda now. <laughs> right, but if I, if I do want to write a book, as a, as a plain boring academic, it is actually my dream to write a widely used textbook on investment that many, <laughs> many uni students actually use. And so I want to be in a position where, let's say, if I meet someone 20 years from now, that fella or that person is going to tell me, tell me Oh, hi, Marty. So I've read your tw- textbook 20 years ago when I was back at uni <laughs> and I find it really useful. So that's, I guess, my dream as a plain, boring academic. So hang on. So to do that, you're going to have to have a catchy title because it can't just be, you know, <laughs> the market. Like, what are you, you going to call it? So it's probably going to be like, let's say, fundamental fundamentals of investment or I guess a behavioral aspect in investment or something like that. So it'll be something about finance, stock market and investment. Yeah, I've got to say that, Marty, like listening to you tonight, I, I would almost expect the title of the book to be Don't Do It. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it to the professionals. <laughs> or, or maybe then in short print, in small print down the bottom, unless you read my book. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate your time. And um, I'm sure we'll talk again at some point in the future. Yeah. Mm. Thanks again for having Thanks, me. Money. And everyone out there as well, all the listeners, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. As always, uh, Help My Wealth and Money Rules, Money Rules is all about empowering your financial journey. I hope that's been uh, helped today when we've talked to uh, Dr. Marty Chow and talked about uh, gambling, uh, finances, the share market, influences, and everything else. So bye, and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you. Thank you. The information discussed by the Help My Wealth and the Money Rules, Money Rules podcast is for education and entertainment purposes only and is generally nature and it is not advice. It is not intended as a substitute for professional finance, legal or tax advice. It is aimed to provide a general understanding of each topic and should not be relied upon to make an investment or financial decision. It is strongly suggested that you seek professional advice regarding your own individual circumstances before making a financial decision. Help My Wealth and the hosts of the Money Rules and Money Rules podcast are not aware of your personal financial circumstances. Before making any financial decisions, you should read the product disclosure statement and, if necessary, consult a licensed financial professional. Do not take financial advice from a podcast. In the spirit of reconciliation, Help My Wealth and the Money Rules or Money Rules podcast acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to past, present and emerging elders. We extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today.